Brand new designs are up on the Edge Redbubble, werewolves, spiders, FedEx amphibians, protocrocs, and more. Go check out the Redbubble with links in the description and comment section below. You're never gonna find a parasite that makes sense, nor one that isn't disgusting, not a one that doesn't seem to defy biology. Being a parasite is gruesome work, and it changes the bodies of genus and species to such degrees that they no longer look like even close relatives. It may be gruesome work, but being a parasite is the best gig any organism can ask for. It's basically finding the laziest, easiest way to catch a ride and a meal, and many times much more than that. In a way, a parasite is a perfect organism as they don't have to hunt and kill their own food and can just stay safely snug in someone's vital organs, nestled in their skin folds or anchored to their anus flaps. Good stuff. The most bizarre of the parasites are the crustaceans. That's exactly because we are so familiar with the major forms of crustaceans. There are the long floppy ones, the long pinchy ones, the short and squat scuttly ones, the pill-shaped armadillo ones, and the ones we put in cocktails. Beyond them, though, are the ones that resemble clams or oysters, plus a whole class of usually itty-bitty flea-like creatures. This group is called the Hexanoplia, and are composed mostly of animals which fall under the description of plankton. It is split into two groups. One is the Tantulocarida, which is a group of 33 species of highly specialized parasites, but we aren't here for them today. The second, much bigger group is the Copopoda. These guys are pretty much worldwide and universal in every sense of the word. They live in all saltwater and freshwater, in the soil, in caves, and anywhere that has any amount of moisture. There are 13,000 known species. In those 13,000, some have developed the lives of parasites. That's just kinda a thing that's just gonna happen when your group is so widespread and diverse. 75% of all the parasitic copepods come from one order, the Siphonostomatoida. These guys have seen great success because their mouthparts are siphons and have what is called a frontal filament, a mass of filamentous tentacles used to adhere themselves to their hosts. Most of these bastards are marine, with only a few partaking in the freshest of waters. There are 39 families in this order, but today we want to zero in on the one called Spheriridae. The reason for the zero in is thanks to this image I saw on Twitter. Like, seriously, what is that thing? There's a whole wild world of parasitic crustaceans I've barely touched a toe into, so let's begin with these silly looking monsters. Most copepods start out their lives as an egg. Once they hatch, they look like a ball with little legs bristling with antennae. This first stage of their lives is called the Noplia stage. It's pretty much a head and tail fused together, with no discernible middle section, thorax or abdomen. They have about three pairs of limbs, ending in long, thin claws that are more like whiskers than anything. In normal copepods, this little bouncing beach ball will molt many times as it eats and grows until it resembles a normal copepod, these vaguely shrimp and silverfish-like creatures. Not so in the parasites, and not so in the siphoned-mouthed copepod, scientifically known as spherion. Biologists today are usually ecstatic in finding subspecies or new species that look incredibly similar to known ones, or even species that have been hiding inside others this whole time. Back in the heyday of privileged, rich white scientists and very little knowledge base, new species were being named and described literally all the time. So, despite how small and insignificant these parasitic copepods are, and despite how you might assume they'd be overlooked this whole time, they have been known to Western science since 1830. The great naturalist and zoologist Georges Cuvier named Spherion all the way back in 1830. And a bunch of species have been named of this genus that we don't need to know about because they all do pretty much the same thing, and searching for papers on these critters is always super duper unfun. This is one of the reasons I prefer paleontology. <laughs> anyway, for those interested, there's <gasps> Levigatum, Lumpi, Quadricornis, Australicus, Delage Eye, King Eye, Croyer Eye, Norvegicum, and Stuartia. <sighs> uh. 
The one in this image that started this video is Spherion lumpi, which was named as a different animal in 1843 as Lestes lumpi. Thanks to being that damn old, there's no primary source I can show you, but I know that Lestes is also a Latin Greek root for thief, as in Ornitholestes, which I think is a fitting genus name for a parasite. Too bad it got sunk back into Spherion later on. <laughs> what do you want for 19th century science? Once that Nauplius stage eats and grows enough, it molts into the adult stages. These crusty bloodsuckers are extremely sexually dimorphic. Sexual dimorphism is the term that describes how the sexes are different biologically. Some animals look the same, some are mildly different, and some are just bonkers. As different as human males, females, and everything in between are, we really don't have much in the way of sexual dimorphism compared with other animals. We have what is considered mild sexual dimorphism. Enough about us, back to the sticky yickies. These mini crustaceans are heavily sexually dimorphic. The males look like tardigrades, like pudgy teddy bears. They have two pairs of thick, fatty limbs, followed by a big lump, which is a vestigial version of what's called the caudal ramus. That's a part of the tail in other normal copepods. This guy right here is almost a millimeter in length, but they may get bigger. The front looks like a horror show of limbs, spines, and mouth parts. The female gets way worse. This is where the fun begins. Where the male takes the anatomy of a copepod and forces it into tardigrade shapes, the female forces it into a blood-sucking flower shape. This is the female. The body is made up of three main parts. A head, a neck, and a trunk. The top up here, the flower head looking thing, is the cephalothorax. It's the mouth, head, and torso, all shoved into a teeny space. Then you got the stem of the flower. The stomach starts near the top, and the intestines go down the stem into the vat-like organ near the bottom. The only purpose of the female is to find a host and to reproduce. That's why she has all these frilly internal organ-looking things sprouting off her bottom. These are called posterior processes and oviducts, and are gross, and I hate them. Once she has found a host, she metamorphoses into the flower shape from the nauplius shape and digs her mandibles into the flesh of her host. The flower head expands and locks her head inside the host so she can suck as much blood as she damn well pleases. This process is likely aided by upchucking digestive fluids to make it easier to burrow through the poor host. Hosts mainly being fish, especially fish of the Sebastes genus. They have also been found on a ton of others from the deep sea to the surface and in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. So, happy I brought these things to your attention? There are plenty of other parasitic crustaceans that are super gross and awesome to talk about, so maybe I'll bring them up here another time. The 3D models in this video were made by Kuzim, or Adam Midzuk, and the animations were made by Tyler Addison. Their socials will be included in the description and the comment section below. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks goes to my elephant tier patrons, Thea Svensson, Staniforth Hopkins, Dinosaur, Chris Frampton, Biotaverse, Arda Bayer, and Christoph Hubbinger, as well as my Tyrannosaur patrons, Iron Bladesman, Henry Brennan, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester.